So thank you very much. You can hear me, I think. Is that correct? All right. So Susie has said I should give you a little bit of my background, and I won't spend very much time. But um, the first thing you need to know is that my undergraduate work is in fine arts. And so I bring that perspective to taxation, whatever that means. Um, at one point, I was in a, conver in a me large meeting of the U.S. Internal Revenue Service where we were discussing hiring people with different backgrounds um, into the agency, and I said that I thought we should have more fine arts majors in the IRS, and the commissioner looked at me and said, one is enough, period. <laughs> so um, with that background, um, I found my way into tax and went to law school, um, later in life, um, founded uh, the first low-income taxpayer clinic in the United States that represented taxpayers um, as a legal aid society. Um, and we coordinated lawyers and accountants to represent taxpayers before the IRS and the state tax agencies and the tax um, courts for free so that taxpayers who could not afford um, representation would be able to have access to justice in the tax field. And that work, um, 1992 on, brought me to the attention of the United States Congress. Um, and in uh, 1998, there was a major IRS reform bill as a result of some of the actions that the IRS was taking against taxpayers. One of the things they did was reorganize and strengthen the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate um, and created the position of the National Taxpayer Advocate, whose job it was within the IRS to um, help taxpayers solve their problems within the, with the IRS and make administrative and legislative recommendations to mitigate those problems. And uh, there was an initial National Taxpayer Advocate who was appointed in 1999, and that person did all the heavy lifting of hiring all the employees and establishing all the offices. And then that was so exhausting that he left. Um, so I was appointed the second national taxpayer advocate in January 2001, and I served 18 years in that position until August, July 2019. And upon my leaving the IRS, I founded a nonprofit, the Center for Taxpayer Rights, which was to basically continue the work I'd done in my entire life, working on taxpayer rights, um, both in the United States and around the world, which brings me here. Um, and normally, you know, I make notes about what I want to talk about, and then I attend the conference, and everybody's saying such interesting things that I throw out all my notes and you know, sort of just talk about what everybody else has said. So we'll see where I go with this. I will be as interested as you are, maybe you're not interested, but I would like to see where I'm going with this. So um, I come from the concept of taxpayer rights, first of all, from a human rights perspective. And I'm also very sensitive to the rights of more vulnerable individuals who have to navigate government processes and don't have the wherewithal to do that. And I also come from it from obviously a United States perspective and our constitution and the concept of due process in the constitution in the United States, which is founded on the idea that government makes mistakes. Government can get it wrong. And so because it can get it wrong, you need to tap individuals or persons, whether they're legal persons or human persons, have to have the have notice of the government's position and what they're planning to do, and then have the opportunity to be heard. And that is a fundamental constitutional principle for due process. However, in the United States, the United States Supreme Court early on with the enactment of our federal income tax um, in 1913 meant, said, 
that taxes are the lifeblood of government. And so the collection thereof is an imperious need. That's quite a sentence. It's the lifeblood of government and the collection thereof is an imperious need. And therefore it is okay for the government to take the tax dollars and then have a hearing and you know, do process after you take the dollars because the collection of the tax dollars is an imperious need. And that is actually our constitutional interpretation, the United States Supreme Court interpretation, which is the bedrock of the concept of tax exceptionalism, that tax is somehow different from other areas of law. And I would honestly say that I've spent most of my life fighting against that concept. Um, but what has also happened is that in the United States, Congress has stepped in and said, well, that's the Constitution, but we'll create statutory protections that will allow for hearings bef in, before the courts before you have to pay the tax. So what's, what you don't have in constitutional protections, you have in statutory protections. So that's just the groundwork for the United States. The other thing you need to know about the United States is a very large tax administration, um, and it affects many, many taxpayers, more than maybe most tax administrations do. We have 155 million individual taxpayers who file an annual return. There is no pre-populated return. It is all up to the individual household to file their income tax return each year. There are 22 million business taxpayers, including 10 million corporate taxpayers that are annually filing. So that's a lot of human beings and the government, the IRS collects between three and four trillion US dollars every single year. Basically about 96% of all of the federal revenue that the government, the federal government gets. So that's a lot of dollars and that's a lot of taxpayers to try to interact with and deal with. Um, and what we know about United States taxpayers starting from the Boston Tea Party on down the generations is that they don't like taxation um, and um, particularly taxation without representation. I will also say that I'm a resident of the District of Columbia. I have no representation that votes in the United States Congress and my license plate says no taxation without representation on my car. That is the official District of Columbia license plate. Um, having said that, there is a crisis in trust between taxpayers in the United States and, and the Internal Revenue Service. Um, and a lot of my work has been in how do you build that trust? And I was very touched by you know, the, the discussion about how you build trust and cooperation today. I start from the point of view that enforcement is key to building trust. Um, a colleague and dear friend of mine, Eric Kirchler from the University of Vienna the School of Applied Psychology um, has developed a theory called the slippery slope theory. But what it really looks at is the relationship between trust and the use of power. And um, if you really think about it, to build trust with taxpayers, part of it is that they need to know that other taxpayers are paying what they're required to pay under law. And if you have people who are actively trying not to pay what they're required to pay, you can erode trust in other taxpayers if you are not taking action against those taxpayers who are not paying. That's a legitimate use of trust. But tr I mean, that's a legitimate use of power. But if you use power illegitimately, coercively, in a way that it is disproportionate to what the, the non-compliance is, you can also erode trust and you can convert compliant taxpayers or taxpayers trying to comply into non-compliant taxpayers. To me, compliance is a continuum where you have taxpayers who have made simple mistakes, to taxpayers who are actively not just trying to minimize their tax, 
but evade taxation, you know, onto the criminal scale. And if you miss the right touch with those taxpayers and anywhere along the line, you can erode trust from the rest of the taxpayers. So it is key to understand the motivation of taxpayers, the reason why they are being non-compliance so that you can apply the appropriate, the appropriate touch, which can be criminal investigation or it can be education. Go and sin no more. I'm not even going to bother to assess you. I'm sending you a letter. I'm saying, did you know you know, we've looked at your return. We think you've made a mistake. Don't do it again. And by the way, we're watching. You know, and then there's lots of, you know, research about what that kind of touch has on taxpayers who are trying to comply. Now, taxpayers who don't care have high risk tolerance. You know, that letter goes in the trash, you know, but, but then you have to, you know, accelerate your trust. Valerie Braithwaite, in Australia in 2003 developed the responsive regulation pyramid, which is very important in that way, that the most, most of your taxpayers, even if they're not getting it right, are trying to comply. And you approach them in that way until evidence proves you otherwise. And then you go up the pyramid with your your regulatory approaches, you're responding to the type of behavior and the motivation for that behavior. It's not enough to say taxpayer owes X dollars. It's why did they get to that place? And that defines how you're going to respond to them, which means you have to be very sophisticated about your communications, your research, the way you're thinking about taxpayers and your approach to taxpayers. So trust is key. I have to say in the Internal Revenue Service, because we have so many taxpayers, that it is the large taxpayers, the large corporate taxpayers and the most wealthy taxpayers, the taxpayers with the highest income, that get the Cadillac service. Maybe I should now say the Tesla service, you know, where they're getting that personal service. The vast majority of individual audits, 80% of individual audits, in the United States or controls as you may call them are done by correspondence. And there is no one human being assigned to that case. So if you call up the IRS one, good luck in getting through on the phones because our phone service has been so bad that the IRS is answering about 15% of the calls that it receives. Let me repeat that, 15% of the calls it receives. So let's, what is the impact of that on trust? can't get through. If you can't get through, the machines just start moving along and they send out letters that, you know, assess the tax, you know, start collecting the tax automatically, just go out there. What bank accounts do you have? You owe us this money. We're taking it. You try to get through and call and say, don't take my money. I need to pay for medication. I need to pay for my something for my children. Nope. The machines are just moving and you can't get through. What does that do to trust? That is the tax individual taxpayers experience because there is no one entity, there's no one person working a taxpayer case. And partly because of the size of the taxpayer population, because automation has made it so much easier to do these impersonal touches, which the agency thinks are highly efficient and the taxpayer thinks are lousy because they can't get through. You know, this is a, this is a, breakdown in the relationship between the taxpayer and the agency. And into that void steps the Taxpayer Advocate Service, the organization that I headed for 18 years. And one branch of the Taxpayer Advocate Service is to help taxpayers who are having problems resolving their issues with the IRS. They have to be experiencing significant hardship. Something the IRS is doing or about to do or not doing is causing them harm, not just inconvenience, but harm. And that falls into two categories. And this is all law. I didn't make this up. I've got a statute or I had a statute that defined my mission and how I went about my mission. There can be economic harm. 
And by the way, that was just not for individual taxpayers, but business taxpayers as well, and taxpayers who are represented, because sometimes their representatives can't get a solution to a problem, notwithstanding all of their skill. They can't get through to the right person. So you have economic harm or you have systemic harm, that you have tried to solve a problem through the normal channels and no one is listening. It could very well be that you're presenting a case of first impression and the IRS has no procedures or guidance out there to address it. And their response is, we don't have any procedures to address it. You know, and my job is to say, well, that's the beginning of the conversation. Now, how are you gonna go about getting procedures to address this issue? So the Taxpayer Advocate Service takes in those cases. We are part of the IRS. We have access to all the IRS information. I say we, I'm no longer part of the Taxpayer Advocate Service, but the we is hard after 18 years of saying we, so give me a break. Um, so you know the employees are able to see the IRS records on that taxpayer situation. The other thing is we were talking about in Italy, the number of case systems, you know, and data systems, the IRS has at least 60 major case management systems that contain taxpayer data, and none of them communicate with the other. My employees had access to most of those systems. So we were one of the few employees and organizations, you know, units within the IRS who could actually see what was going on throughout, which was often key because sometimes, you know, the taxpayers talking over here and they're trying to get action stopped over here in the collection realm while they resolve, you know, a disagreement about how much they actually owe. But they can't get those two parts to talk. And part of our job was to stop this from happening while this got resolved. We got, during my 18 years, 4 million cases, which is an incredible database of cases to look at involving multinational entities, very wealthy taxpayers and the very lowest income taxpayers you can imagine. The United, the IRS, um, distributes about $32 billion every single year to 26 million US taxpayers who are defined as low income, low income workers with families. We, we send out major um, welfare benefits through the tax system. So in order for those people to get, a, get that money, they have to file an income tax return and they can get things wrong and they're sucked into that system and they barely have enough money to pay for their food on the table. And yet they're having to negotiate a machine, not a live human being, but a machine to get the right answer. So we had the whole gamut of cases. And part of that gamut of cases provided an incredible database for us to make recommendations for systemic change, which was also part of our work to make not just working the individual, the specific cases, you know, one taxpayer at a time, but looking at those issues and saying, here's a systemic problem. And the systemic problem could be because the law was so complex that the IRS was tying itself up in knots trying to administer it, or that the taxpayer, it was so confusing or so unclear or so vague that the taxpayer was getting it wrong according to the IRS. And so we would make either administrative recommendations to reduce administrative and compliance burden or additional training of employees, but we'd also make legislative recommendations. And my charge was to report twice a year to the United States Congress making administrative and legislative recommendations without the IRS or the Treasury Department or the White House seeing what I recommended. This is unheard of and might even be unconstitutional, but I'm not telling anybody. Um, so, you know, I submitted about 39 reports to Congress over my tenure. Um, 
And many of my legislative recommendations were in fact enacted into law. They were all taxpayer protections. They're not tax policy, but they arose from our casework, which showed us what was actually happening to taxpayers. And the strength of that was normally when you go into the agents and you say, there's this issue and they'd say, well, that's just a, a one-off issue. And you'd go, well, actually, no, I have 40,000 cases with this. And that suddenly brings the agency to the table. They can no longer dismiss me because it's just one, one weird person doing something. No, it's a process that's a problem. Or it's a training issue. Or it's the way you've given your employees guidance. You know, or it's that you're identifying taxpayers as being bad actors instead of starting from the assumption that people are trying to comply. Which brings me to this slide. I wasn't gonna do a slide and yay to our, you know, audiovisual people for getting this slide up. This is from one of my reports to Congress. Um, back in 2008, 2007, you know, Offshore compliance was really getting onto the IRS's radar. Several of the largest entity, you know, tax administrations in the world were getting together to talk about how to share tax information. And Congress held a whole series of hearings about offshore evasion. And they used that word evasion. I kept starting to raise my hand that, you know, there were lots of reasons why taxpay US taxpayers had accounts overseas. We have a very diverse population, lots of people coming to the United States, and um, they also have family members overseas, so they may have accounts overseas, take care of their parents or something like that. The United States is unique because we tax all U.S. citizens on their worldwide income, unless there's a treaty that says we don't tax there, and we agree to give up our taxing rights. We also tax US residents on their worldwide income. And in the tax law, residency is not immigration status. It's that you happen to be in the United States for a certain period of time. If you are born to US parents, you are a US citizen unless you revoke it. So the entire country of Canada, like half of it is US citizens, even if they've never set foot into the United States. Um, one day they woke up and found out that all these years they'd had the responsibility to report any account that was in a foreign financial institution with a balance over $10,000 at any point during the year. That led to people panicking. The IRS was enforcing that provision, but it announced a settlement program saying, if you come in, all of you people, if you come in and disclose your, la your returns for X number of years, even beyond our statute of limitations period, and tell us about your offshore accounts and pay the tax, you will pay a flat penalty rate. We can go up to 50% of the account balance for six years, okay? Even if the account balance isn't that, it doesn't even exist today. We can still chart, we can still penalize you on that. That's just the penalty. So here are the results of the first round of that settlement initiative. What you have here is we, we, this is my office's report. We looked at the median account balance for the bottom 10%, the lowest account balance dollar level, $44,000 in an account offshore, as opposed to the top 10% that had 7.2 million as the median offshore. So then you look at what the tax is going to be. That was over 10 years for the lowest 10%, basically $147 a year over 10 years. That's what was the revenue lost to the government. Higher, you know, $40, $45,000 a year for the top 10%. Look at the penalty that people paid, which was a 20% penalty. For the lowest 10%, it was almost 600% of the actual tax that was due. That's the penalty. For the top 10%, penalty was 300%. What is that penalty? It's a regressive penalty. 
the least amount of non-compliance, you are penalizing twice as much as the highest amount of non-compliance. What does that do to trust? Take a look at the unrepresented percentage. At the lowest 10%, almost a third of the taxpayers were unrepresented when they came into this path you know, this, this offshore initiative, and the penalty percentage went up to almost 800%. That approach, assuming every single taxpayer who had an offshore account was a bad actor and treating them the same way as people who were actively sheltering a lot more money overseas is a disproportionate use of power a violation of taxpayer rights, a violation of the principle of proportionality. When I tried to publish this information, the IRS came back to me because we do send the information in my, my annual reports over to an IRS function to say, please check our data. We've pulled it from your system, but I don't want to come out and then have them afterwards go, well, you're wrong. So they said, no, no, you're right, but you can't disclose this data because it's tax enforcement results. You can't let anybody know that this is what's happening. And I said, well, you're disclosing all sorts of other data about that has all this stuff. And they said, yeah, yeah, but this is different. So I told them what we would do is we would publish the chart and black out all the numbers. And then people would start doing Freedom of Information Act requests to get that data. And they'd spend a lot of time in court trying to, un you know, and they finally said, oh, oh, OK, Nina, you can publish that. We won't object. And that was the first and really only data that's ever come out from these programs. So I use that as an example to show how easily trust can be eroded if you assume, if you forget that message of the, the continuum of compliance and you do not approach taxpayers and your settlement programs or your enforcement initiatives or your customer service from that knowledge of the continuum of compliance and then tailor your approaches to that particular um, motivational posture. And I'll end there. Um, I've taken a fair amount of time, but I wanted to get that slide in because I think that's relevant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina, for this uh, very fascinating presentation. I'm sure there are some questions from the audience. And if not, I have a few. Yes, Sandra, you have a microphone. Um, maybe just a quick question in terms of, um, I, I don't know enough about the American school system to know if this is even plausible, but educating taxpayers at some earlier stage, because obviously there is a, a lot of responsibility on, on the part of the IRS and uh, you know all the automated pro processes that you're talking about that create all these problems but maybe is there what's your view on 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 educating taxpayers at an earlier stage so that they're more well equipped to sort of you know take on the responsibility of of handling their own tax returns now, obviously you won't get everyone but but you know somewhere in primary secondary school maybe is that something that has been discussed so you know again you when you have this many taxpayers the IRS is actually been, and I think this is a challenge, they've been centralizing more of their functions. So whereas they used to be spread out around the United States and in different communities, there would be IRS employees responsible for doing education and outreach activities, they've centralized them more. So there's no longer a local presence in communities of the tax agency. So the IRS primarily puts materials on its website and says, we've done our job. And then they look for others to do the education. And if you're, you know, unless you're linked into that network or unless you have representation, you may not get that education. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons with the Taxpayer Advocate Service, interestingly, Congress required the Taxpayer Advocate Service, the organization I led, to have at least one office in every single state of the United States so that we were mandated to have a local presence. 
and we required each local office was headed by a local taxpayer advocate. And I required each of those local taxpayer advocates to do at least 40 major outreach events each year, going out and talking to taxpayers and talking to them about the problems that we might see arising in that community and educating them about that. That was a, we made up that role. That is the role of the IRS, but they had given up that local communication for a more centralized, which I think is a real problem. Not, not knowing when you actually did that throughout your tenure, did, did you actually see an impact? Did you see that when they started doing the outreach programs that, that you know, there was, I don't know how you measure it, but what was there in a uh, visible? You know, impact? it's really interesting. That's a great question. So when we would get cases in that dealt with collection matters, and we, in our cases, we generally had about 70% of our cases, we got a reversal of the IRS's position. And with the collection matters, we could check and see whether the taxpayer going forward, after coming into us for help, would become more compliant going forward. And we could show that. With exam matters, audit matters, where the IRS was saying, you owe this amount, and we would get that reversed when we tried to go forward saying, well, now, did that change the taxpayer's behavior going forward? This is a, an AI, an artificial intelligence issue. The only way to measure, like IR scores returns based on a risk assessment system. They never incorporated our results back into that risk assessment system. So even though we knew the taxpayer was entitled to something on their return, the next year, the IRS risk assessment system still identified that return as an, as an you know, non-compliant return. So we could never come up with a good hard measure of our impact on future compliance and audit because of the way the risk assessment system was programmed, not incorporating our 4 million cases in and teaching the machine on the results of our cases. Doesn't really incite good behavior, does it? That, that you can't, that you can't yeah. get it to go around. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting about the, the phone answering percentage was it 15 not 50 15 uh, 15 percentage of what the irs yeah 15 the calls. one five yeah I, one yeah. five and and uh, because uh, in in i was talking about the large business perspective but but we we do a lot of phone service and and very high goals on that uh, it, it's a very important part of, very important part of the customer satisfaction uh, perspective also. So I would like to ask, uh, do you think it's, it's, it's like a sheer impossibility to, or how much resources would it take to, to make, make, make that to an acceptable level in the US, maybe like, uh, yeah, you know, or I something? think this goes to, you know, trust is not just between the taxpayer and the IRS, it's between the United States Congress and the IRS, because they're the funding entity for the IRS. And over the years, the trust level has gone, you know, is completely down. Congress has, at least some members of Congress have woken up to, we can't keep cutting the IRS's budget. The phones are a result of budget constraints. And so in the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed this year, the IRS got $80 billion over a 10 year period. And the Secretary of the Treasury has set a goal for the IRS to hire enough employees to reach an 85% you know, level of service on the phones next filing season, which is 2023. So you know, trying to hire that many people, good luck with that in that period of time and train them. But it's really important to have that as a goal, which the IRS has not set as a goal in at least 10 years. So, you know, I've always felt, you know, set that goal and then figure out what you need to do. And this is the first time in over a decade that it's been able to have the resources to actually pull that off. And then there's a whole, the majority of the resources are for enforcement, you know, or, you know, um, more high dollar, large entity, com you know, compliance. 
but they're really front-loading the taxpayer service expenditures, and I commend them on that. 